Hey, welcome back. I have to make four sets of parts, 10 each, and this is one of them. Uh, as usual, I cannot tell you what these are. Uh, customer would not appreciate that. Fairly involved process, especially on these parts. So they are machined out of uh, 14305 stainless. That's the ISO des designation. The um, ANSI designation for the seal is uh, 303 stainless. So they're fairly complicated. Uh, OD, ID turning, some boring at an angle, some square boring, and some rotary table action. So let's start with these parts. Hey, these, these are really fun to make. So this next part starts again with six millimeter round bar, 14305 stainless steel that has sulfur in it to help breaking the chip. It's not as corrosion resistant as other stainless steels, but it machines beautiful. And for a lot of environments, this is absolutely good enough. We start with a, with a solid carbide turning tool just facing off the end of the stock. Now we change to a 45 degree tool. Uh, this will cut the OD and uh, and the the leading the leading chamfer of this feature. I'm going almost to full depth. I'm leaving 50 micron for finishing, which is a very odd finishing allowance, but this works very well. This is ground out of fine grain carbide and it's diamond lapped to a razor sharp edge. The way this is dimensioned is dimension of this edge. There we go, reasonable good finish. Quick check of our dimension, should be 3.8, uh, 3.807, so 70, 7 micron oversize. Tolerance on this diameter is plus minus 50 microns, so that's good. Putting a tiny chamfer on the edge of the part. Now it gets drilled all the way through, reamed and then a pocket bored out on the end. This is a 2H7 reamer. H7 is, is the ISO standard for uh, the tolerance field and the size of the tolerance. If there is interest in ISO tolerancing of diameters and fits, I might do a video on it. I'm not promising because that's a very dry topic. I'm using a small ball nose burr to, to put a tiny tiny chamfer on the pre-drilled hole. Now we switch to a small to, to a small boring bar to a tiny boring bar. This is a a Guring Series 104 boring bar. This this can start in a 1.4 millimeter hole. Solid carbide, uh, titanium nitride coated. I use these quite some time now, and these are really nice. Uh, sometimes you just don't want to grind your own tool, and then it's nice to be able to buy something. They are not cheap. One of those uh, cutting inserts, they have a four millimeter shank. One of them is about 15 euros. So yeah, they are kind of cheapish and kind of not. If you if you count your time that you need to to grind one of these, yeah, might be cheaper to buy them. But sometimes you need a tool right now, then it's a good idea to 
to go, be able to grind it at least. Uh, using a magnifier to to get my to get my C offset. This needs to be 3.2 millimeters and uh, 1.6 deep. The tolerance on this bore is 3.2 millimeters plus 0.1. So it can be 3.2 or 3.3 and anything in between. But good practice is to put your final dimension right in the center of your tolerance. That gives you some safety. So here is a 3.25 millimeter gauge pin. And this very very barely goes in a 3.2 goes in nicely <laughs> goes in very sloppy in fact and a 3.3 which is the largest dimension allowed doesn't even start in the hole that way you can judge a, a whole hole diameter very precisely even if your gauge pin set is only in uh, 50 micron increments you can also use um, these guys, uh, small hole gauge, sm small bore gauges. These are surprisingly accurate. These are split and have a small taper here on the end, a wedge. And with the screw on the back, you, you split them up. And it's basically an adjustable gauge pin. I like to adjust them until I have a tiny, tiny bit of drag in the bore. Then I take my, my digital micrometer and check by rotating the small hole gauge between the anvils until I get a little bit of drag. There we go, that, that's a little bit of drag. And look at the dimension and that's 3.24. So very close to the dimension I checked with the gauge pins. That's a little bit touch and feel using those. Large ball carbide burr, putting a small chamfer on large color bore, and the small ball nose uh, burr to deburr the hole in the bottom of the pocket. Just doing it by hand. Kratex stick, just to, to shine up any, any machine surface, round over every tiny sharp corner and remove any hairline burrs. So, not much features to cut on this side. We will have to cut two slots later on the milling machine on each side of the part with a small slitting saw, but that's mill work. So, uh, you can see the finish of it. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty decent. It's very serviceable, let's call it that way. Now we take a small carbide part of blade and cut it off. I face the part to length and then this side gets bored in a, in a two-step bore, 2.5 millimeter and 2.6 millimeters, about seven millimeters deep. The parts are already faced to length. I just miked them and used the DRO to cut the excess material. And now I'm using the same uh, Guring solid carbide boring bar uh, that I used before. To, to cut those uh, relatively deep holes. I'm running at 1800 RPM, taking a depth of cut 
of 100 micron for roughing and for finishing uh, a depth of cut of 50 micron. And for the finished cut, I take a spring pass to get any tool deflection out. And I'm hand feeding at about the rate that's uh, 30 microns per revolution. But I don't dare to run it with, with actual power feed. It's a little bit iffy. <laughs> this bore should be 2.5 plus. It should be almost, it can be between 2.52 and 2.56. Uh, this is a 2.5 millimeter pin and this goes loosely in and the 2.55 does not go in. So I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely in the range of the bore. If, if a, if a 2.5 millimeter pin is that loose, I know that the bore is probably 20 microns over size. And now we need to cut a very close tolerance hole, 2.6 H7, which is 2.6 plus 10 microns at max in front of it, not to full depth. And I'm going directly from 2.5 to 2.6 in one pass with a spring pass. That's 50 microns depth of cut per side. Point six millimeter pin. This should go in barely. There we go. And it has almost no no feelable uh, wiggle in the bore. So that's good. Just taking a Kratex stick. Removing any hairline burrs there. Not really necessary because everything gets machined off on the end anyway, but for handling and measuring purposes, that's a good touch. Get the part out. Continuing, now we're over on the milling machine. I have a grinding wise held in my large wise because I like the slightly elevated position. It's a little bit more sensible with the fine screw feed and it's overall a little bit more accessible. I super glued in a gauge block here to act as parallel where the part sits on and I super glued on here a second gauge block to act as a work stop. And all we have to do in this setup is mill a flat and drill a hole and bore it. We start with a 6mm 6 flute carbide end mill and we're milling a, a 0.4mm deep flat on this part. See, not, not every step on every part that's made in a shop that has to make money is all about material removal. Sometimes it's about the small cuts. Uh, 2.5 millimeter carbide drill running also at 1500 RPM. Now the last tool is the Wohlhaupt the UPA1 boring head with a tiny carbide boring bore. I have to be a bit careful. I don't want to change the C height uh, to keep my XY position dead accurate. If you move the C axis on this machine, eh, it tends to, to shift a little bit. So I set it up in a way that I can do all my operations without moving the C axis. And that means that I have to thread the the boring head, head in with the boring bar between the jaws of the vise. We're taking about four cuts. This has to be a relatively precise fit. This is a press fit with another tiny part and press fits with small parts are always a bit tricky. And we run it at a thousand RPM. I wish I had, in fact, I ordered a 
different boring head for the future, a small Schmidt boring head that can run up to 3000, 4000 RPM. Uh, the UPA1 is limited to 1000 RPM. That's what's stated in the manual. You can probably run it at 3000 if, if um, the slide is almost in the center, like in this case, but I don't dare to. I don't want to get hit in the head by this thing. That's uh, reasonably annoying. I just set my C height of the tool um, by approaching the, the, the milled surface and looking at the light gap. The depth is not very critical just cannot be too deep. I put some blue paint on here so we see when it actually cuts. So we barely took a cut, that's good. Now we take a 10 micron cut. Okay, that cleaned it up completely. And we can move the table out and just idiot check. I have two pins here. And I have a uh, 2.6 and a 2.59 millimeter pin. And those are my, my gauging tools. And once this slides in ever so, once I can, put this in the bore completely, I know I'm good. If the 2.6 millimeter slides in, uh, we have a problem. <laughs> there we go. That's, that's perfect fit. Not going to complain about this. I need a little bit of force to push the 2.59 millimeter pin in. And the 2.6 barely starts. Oops. Using a four fluted carbide uh, chamfer mill to put ever so slightly countersink on here, deburring the edge. And this one is done. This is really the kind of work I like to do. I do not have much interest in work with large material removal or large parts. That's, that's not my expertise. Uh, this, this is what I like to do. So here's a close up of the part. You can see the bored cross hole. And of course, drilling and boring creates a burr on the inside of the, uh, of the other hole. And how do you deep burr that? Uh, that that's kind of tricky and the way I came up with I, I have a hardened 2.6 millimeter pin this is a um, out of a punch and die tooling a, a 2.6 millimeter high-speed steel punch and it's um, ground sharp on the end has a sharp edge not deburred and we just take the part and this is a 2.6 millimeter hole on the end and we just shear off the burr on the inside like this and there is the chip from the burr hard to show on camera but when I focus on the inside of the bore there is no burr left. The sharp pin sheared it away cleanly, not leaving a secondary burr. Um, I did that on, uh, I did that previously on other parts and it, it works usually quite well. If that doesn't work, you have to come in with some kind of a tiny scraper or a tiny abrasive brush and try to deburr and break the edge of the cross hole. That's quite annoying. The next step is to cut this 45 degree angle here and bore out a pocket uh, diameter 5.4 millimeter, one millimeter deep. And this geometry that you can see, this is what we get as a result. I have a 5C collet block at an angle at 45 degree, of course. And my wife have a, a screw jack over here to balance out the vice jaw so I don't rock the everlasting crap out of the vice jaw. And the way you do this, you clamp this a little bit with the vice 
and you put in your screw check, you tighten it ever so slightly up and then you, you torque down the, the vice itself and then it's nice and balanced and you don't crook the movable jaw like crazy. Uh, this is the 3.8 millimeter collet. That's not a standard size 5C. When you buy 5C collets here, the cheap ones come in 0.5 millimeter increments and if you buy an expensive one, they come in 0.1 increments. I took a cheap 3 millimeter collet and bored it out to 3.8. We take our part. Remember, the part has a flat mill on here. This goes down and we tighten the collet block ever so slightly. Uh, and when I take a 5.5 millimeter wrench, I can tweak the rotation of the part like this. So that's what we're doing to indicate the part. Well, we bring in our stylus close to the work and as the surface that we can indicate is quite short, it's only about three to four millimeter long, I'm using a two micron indicator here. So we get a, a usable result. So we traverse and it's dropping. So we take the wrench on this side and we just torque it a little bit. Traverse back and we're already pretty darn good. So over here we have 50 and over here we have 43. 43 that means we have to, to raise it over here a little bit. Okay, I like that. Uh, we start at 46 and we drop off. It's basically zero, zero, side to side. Okay. Uh, centered the part in Y and touched off on this edge here. Uh, you move it up until on the edge until the, the edge finder kicks over and then you're exactly on the edge or surface you're touching off. Then you enter just the half diameter of your edge finder into the DRO. And yes, I'm edge finding on an edge. Ugh. It's the radical sharp edge. Um, if we deburred this edge uh, with a heavy chamfer beforehand, uh, we would have a problem now because then we would be at somewhere. <laughs> uh, but in, uh, due to habit and experience, I deburr parts during machining very, very minute. So I can't take uh, edges as a reference in some cases. And in this case, it's not crazy critical. So I can touch off on this edge. If this didn't work, I would, I would make a small plug that goes in this bore with a, with a bearing ball on the end, a tooling ball, that gives me a theoretical center point above this bore that I can indicate with an indicator. Um, if, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, Joe Pye did an excellent video on tooling balls and that would be a great application for that. But I can get away with the accuracy in this case without the tooling ball. Now we switch to a 6mm carbide end mill running at 3000 RPM. And again we touch off up here on the surface. And you saw me taking fairly light passes. I could take this whole bulk of material in one pass without a problem, but it doesn't make sense in this case. The additional time to machine it uh, is minute and the safety not to, to shift the setup, move the part in the collet or do something else stupid 
having that confidence is, is way more important than crazy material removal rates. And here we are again with the wool hop the boring head. We moved to our final hole location. I created a lot of those dimensions in CAD just by doing uh, helping construction lines because the original drawings didn't have those dimensions, of course. Okay, here you can see the tool. This is a small solid carbide boring bar. Um, I have no idea who makes this one. Uh, a friend sent me years ago a ton of them and I don't use them that much, but when I do, they're really nice. So, <laughs> uh, thank you, you know who you are. <laughs> so we traverse the boring head back, then we touch off on, on the surface. For touching off, a little bit of paint goes a long way. We're running at 1000 RPM again. Okay, to take an actual cut, this is too much material still, so we traverse the head back a little bit more. Right, so we're taking 500 micron per uh, diameter per pass. So this is not philo vision here, but I can tell you that the bore gauge just has a tiny little bit of drag in the bore. There we go, 10 parts finished. Uh, all the bores are done. I roughly deburred them so any burr do not interfere with any uh, following machining. Next will be to cut a radius on the end here. That will be interesting because it has to be on a 45 degree angle again. And then last step is to, to cut 2.4 millimeter wide slots on the back with a tiny slitting saw. We'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I have to cut two slots on the end of the part and I made this little fixture that orients the part correctly and holds it securely in place. It's slit here with, with bandsaw and has an M3 uh, cross screw to pinch it and it's held out here in the vise. And yes, I balanced out the vise jaw again, not to rock it too crazy and to get a secure grip on this part. If you don't do this, um, the holding force on, on a part out here is a little bit bad because you're basically only holding in a uh, in a line contact not in a in area contact i will show the fixture once i'm done with this run of parts uh, it's already set up obviously <laughs> and i have no stop for the height i'm touching off on the top surface of the of the clamped part in here uh, there's a 0.4 millimeter slitting saw blade and just by eyeballing that's not that's not good enough so i'm doing the old indicator trick where you bring in an indicator on the quill of the machine and you have it touch the top of the saw blade until you have a little bit of preload on the indicator and now when we make contact with the part with the saw blade the indicator will show how much the saw blade deflects let me let me show you just don't go crazy there you see it right at this point we're making contact with the part now you can either preload it a little bit like go preload it 0 0.2 uh, 0.02 millimeters and hit that number in your DRO or you just 
move it to a point where you move the needle ever so slightly. And that's what I'm going to do in this case. That's good enough. Uh, now we get rid of the indicator. Move it clear, drop down our, our dimension, 1.1 millimeter. And have it run at 300 RPM. It's a little bit fast, but we're cutting almost no material. A fine tooth blade, uh, very thin wall, so this is good. And we can run this dry without problem. Okay, side view loading the fixture. That's the fixture in cross view. I have a large cutout down here and the parts have this flat that we machined earlier. And the part goes in like this and the flat orients against that surface on, on the fixture. So it's oriented correctly. Then we just push it up until it doesn't go any further. And we tighten down the clamping screw a little bit. It doesn't really take a lot. This is like a lens wrench and we have excellent lever length ratios, so clamping is no issue. Last setup on this part. <laughs> this is uh, getting quite involved now. I have a grinding wise on my rotary table, so I can spin it. I have the previous fixture here in, in the vise at 45 degree and I indicated in the, the pocket that we machined about uh, three steps before in there and I'm indicating that in pretty good and clamp the, the vise down. So that will allow me to cut this front radius on this part now. And I'm using the back side of the fixture as a backstop. I take a gauge block butt it up against the back side of the fixture, push the part in I, until I hit the, the gauge block, then I know that I have my right depth setting. It should be reasonably repeatable. This is only a cosmetic radius, so we're not going completely crazy here. Centering the spindle of the mill over the, the board pocket, this is all not crazy tight tolerant, but it's, it's a good idea to get it still reasonably accurate so everything every radius blends nicely a badly blended radius doesn't look very good i'm using a four millimeter six flute end mill yes a red ring indicates an end mill for hard milling but these are relatively sharp sharp edged and cut quite nice so i'm using that and the small diameter and the high count of flutes means that it's going to run reasonably nice You saw me just swinging the radius, took it in two passes with a, uh, at full depth with 0.2 millimeter allowance radius wise and then a finishing climb cut to final dimension. And I have to say this works quite well and goes quite fast. So let's do the other 10. This was just a setup piece. Next are these long slender parts, which are lathe only. All, all that comes now is lathe only. These are turned also 303 stainless, drilled all the way through, almost all the way with one millimeter and the rest with a 0.7 millimeter drill, tiny grooving, some close tolerance work. Pretty tricky part. So let's see how this goes. Part is a long skinny turned piece, only turning, drilling and deburring. And again, we start with a six millimeter stock. And in this case, I use my tool as an actual stop. So I do not have to, to put in all my uh, length offsets each time I make this part. First step is to face it to length and turn the first diameter.
Yes, there are techniques where you turn long, thin sectional parts in one pass to find a dimension. But I found uh, diameter to length ratio in this case not to be a big problem. I only have to take a measuring cut. Uh, this, this deflects a little bit and I have to take a correction cut. Uh, this is 1804, should be 16 minus 50 micron. You saw me doing a, a skim pass a balancing cut which has the same depth of cut as my uh, final cut. So I see how my cutting tool behaves and it's it's pretty spot on. Final dimension is 3.2 millimeters minus 30 micron. There we go. That's all the OD turning. Let's check quickly our dimensions here. 3.2 minus a little bit. This needs to be 2.9 without any exact tolerances. So 2.905 will do. And this one should be 1.6 minus 50 micron. And we have 1.59. So very close to nominal. Staying that close to nominal is maybe not the best practice, but kind of my preferred way sometimes. Fine, fine cut file. Point 0.4 millimeter wide slotting tool, grooving tool, ground out of solid carbide, i.e. an old end mill. Touching off, checking my, my end reference, using a piece of paper in the background to get a better contrast. Try to do this somehow around the camera. I'm just checking the light gap between the parting tool and the end of the part. Moving in, I'll leave the paper here so you get a better contrast. That's uh, actually a good idea. using a small center drill. And switching to a good one millimeter drill. On parts like these, you cannot use any rickety old drill that you have lying around in, in a drawer. It's, you have to inspect it. You have to look at it under the microscope or magnification. Check your cutting, cutting lips, if they are in condition. Checking my C depth, it's zero, perfect. Always double check. Drilled 13 millimeter deep. That's 13 times diameter. Uh, that's what we call in the industry deep hole drilling already. Uh, small ball nose carbide burr. Breaking the edge a little bit. A uh, piece of crate axe stick. Did you know that you can shape them on, on a belt sander or a bench grinder? <laughs> I do now. And uh, over time, my Kratex sticks get a really worn out edge. And on the belt sander, you can re reshape it and give it a nice crisp, crisp corner that goes into the edge of your part. 
or in the corner. Looking pretty decent. Now we switch to a, again, back to the turning tool for a reason. I want to turn down the most of the stock on that will form the back side of the part. So when I do my second op in a soft collet, in an emergency collet, I do not have to hog off that much material. It's much more rigid in this configuration where it's still a large chunk of material. Okay, parting off. Uh, good. I can I can show you a tiny trick for parting off small small caliber work like this. Double check my 0.5. Okay, there we go. That's our parting off position. I will part it off almost all the way through, and then I will put a little bit of finger pressure on the side of the part and that will break up the, the remaining material and not leave any uh, parting off um, a nipple on the end of the part. There we go almost clean end of the part. Unfortunately, I was not able to film the second side. I completely forgot to, got to film one part, but I can walk you through. Uh, once the parts were parted off, I made an aluminum sub collet, which has the contour of the part with all its steps machined into it, bored into it, and then I slid it with a small slitting saw three times to make it into a functional collet. And I turned a groove in here to make the flex more easy. The way this works is goes in a collet, sub collet is in, part drops in, then I can clamp it. And I was able to drill the end with a 70 micron drill and turn down the OD, polish, deeper, done. Uh, not much to do on the second side of these parts. That's the result. I will show a close up. Uh, after the after this here is one of the scrap parts I made everything from from here out the end up up to the groove that's all first side operation all turned in one setup then I made the sub collet held it like this and cut the second side and drilled the end with a 0.7 millimeter drill uh, 700 micron. <laughs> the other side has uh, a thousand micron, otherwise known as a millimeter. All surfaces are. I hit everything once I was done with a with a with a Kratex stick, a rubber bond, fine abrasive, and this takes off all tiny burrs. When you deburr, when you break an edge with a file, you will create a secondary burr, and the Kratex rubber abrasive will take care of that. So these parts are basically done. Uh, last step is to throw them in the tumbler. Next part is simple. This is just a small stainless bushing with precision diameter uh, on the ID and OD. We start with a six millimeter piece of stock again. I use I use the same diameter stock for all of this of this project just to keep the material I need to order at a minimum. Setting the stick out with a, with a steel scale and using a stock DCMT insert that has geometry for stainless to rough away most of the material. Taking a facing cut and removing the bulk of the material in, in one, one fairly heavy cut. 
Then I change to a CCMT insert that I ground a slightly positive chip breaker in it with a tiny, tiny corner radius. This cuts very freely without much pressure. Using some cutting oil and doing a first cleanup pass. At this point it's a good idea to check your dimension and use the dimension you, you measured to check against your DRO and take a finishing cut. When turning such small diameters I found cutting oil to work exceptionally well to deal with the low surface speed issue that you have on turning small diameters. Here I'm turning the small press fit diameter that will be needed to press the part into, into the housing we machined earlier. A ruby stone file for deburring, hitting the flat. This takes, takes care of any raised areas. Tiny edge break, very important for a press fit. Otherwise you shear the material out of the bore. Switching to a 1.9mm stub length drill bit, uh, Guring. Titanium nitride coated, some cutting oil and uh, drilling all the way through. Uh, slightly deeper than the final part will be as I need to ream this hole. using a small countersink to deburr the edge, to break the edge. Doing this by hand and switching to a 2H7 reamer. And yeah, this is on purpose, completely out of free. Reaming at reasonably low speed, about 150 RPM. A P horn cutoff tool with a triangular carbide insert. The insert is ground with a slight angle to the left, about 5 degree, so it doesn't leave a horrendous burr or a, a knob from parting off. Holding the part during part cutoff. This is of course not safe, but I would prefer not to lose the part in the chip bin. Last part are these small, let's call it, they, they, they are like a, a small cap. Board on the inside with flat bottom hole or pocket and turned on the OD to a precision fit and then parted off and cleaned up on the back side by hand. So these are reasonably simple. This part starts again with 6mm stock. It will only be slightly smaller than the stock so I can skip the roughing pass and go directly to my, my finishing tool, the, the sharpened CCMT insert and cut the OD. I'm cutting, cutting uh, the stock to diameter on a larger length than the part because that way I can do multiple parts. Make one, part one off, make one, part one off. And I don't have to turn the OD for each individual part. As usual, checking the OD and taking it to final size. Switching to a 4mm end mill to rough out the flat bottomed hole. Using the tiny Guring boring bar to, to cut the pocket to depth. Very careful. These, these tools are fragile and they can break, but if you, if you handle them with care, 
it'll do a great job in taking uh, 0.2 millimeter depth of cut. Cutting the ID to size. And the ID of this, this part is relatively loose dimensioned. It's not a crazy tight tolerance. And facing the, the floor or the bottom of the, the pocket all the way to the center to get a nice flat surface. Using a Kratex rubber abrasive stick to, to break all the edges and corners, remove any hairline burr, wire burrs, and just shine off the, the overall surface. <laughs> Double checking with my finger, that's not recommended technique. Parting tool. Using a magnifier to, to line up this, the edge of the tool with the edge of the part, moving over the thickness of the part and parting off. I'm not parting it off all the way, I, I leave some material, and then I change to a 45 degree chamfer tool and do a backside chamfer before I finally part it off. That spares me the need to, to make a, a soft collet or an emergency collet to face and chamfer the back side of, the, of, of this part. I will completely part it off to final thickness and I will just clean up the, the back side of the part on some 400 grit emery cloth and remove the remainder of, of the parting operation. I checked that with the customer, he is perfectly fine with that solution and it makes the part a little bit cheaper. Again, one last minute deburr before I part it off. And there we go. I have the parts in the tumbler and as per request of the designer of the parts I'm using these uh, conical stones as a tumbling media. Those are a plastic with an abrasive in them. Uh, I used the stones and about uh, two of these tiny cups of water and a little bit of dish washing soap. And there we go. So I wanted to talk quickly about the boring system I used for the small diameter work on the lathe. That's uh, a Guring system, Guring, that's a German company that makes cutting tools in wide, wide varia variation. And this is their 104 system. Uh, the four stands for the diameter of the shank. This diameter here is in the 104 system four millimeter. They also have a 106, 108 and a, a 110 system which has an, a 10 millimeter shank. But I pretty much decided on the 104 system for my small work because there is a large uh, range of tools. They have boring, they have uh, ID threading, they have slotting tools for, for uh, keyways internal torques profile, uh, internal squares, internal hacks, like uh, single point shaping with, with the lathe. That's quite nifty. And their system is quite clever because it has no fancy shank profile like the P-horn stuff has. P-horn has, um, has a kind of triangular shape which orients the part, which makes making the hold is quite hard. Uh, Goering uses a round shank, which also uh, Sandwick has a round shank system, Ifanger has a round shank system, a lot of manufacturers have them, but I decided on Goering because I get pretty good conditions when buying from them. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I made the holders, I made two of the holders myself and they have basically a four millimeter hole and a screw on top that clamps apart. And the trick is the cross pin back here. This is a one millimeter pin that goes all the way through and the tool shanks have this angle ground on the end. And this slips under the pin and orients the tool always correctly. So there is no guesswork when your tool is correctly oriented. And the cool thing is uh, you can grind your own tools for that system too. Take a 4mm carburetor blank, uh, cut a 45 degree angle on the back and you can and it orients itself. And for grinding tools and that system I made this adapter for the tool and cutter grinder. It has it's, it's, it has a step milled in here to half the diameter so I can use the alignment finger of the D-bit cutter to, to get my orientation. It has the same cross pin that allows me to orient the tool in here. Then I'm ready to grind. But sometimes it's just nice to be able to buy a good working tool without having to grind. And especially with the small boring bar here, uh, that was money spent well worth. Uh, this is like 20 euros and it lasted me all the parts and under the microscope it's still perfectly fine. It has beautiful radius ground onto it. It's uh, titanium nitride coated. It's just a nice tool. Uh, this, star this works on a bore uh, 1.5 millimeter and larger. I have also this one here. This is same 104 system, just a larger boring bar. This time it's titanium aluminum nitride coated and this goes the same way into this, this holder. So very flexible system. I will also make an adapter for my wool hopper boring head so I can use these tools in them and for my new micro boring head. During machining those parts I just showed, I realized that the wool hopper with its uh, 1000 RPM max rating can be problematic for such tiny for such tiny parts. So I went on eBay and found a used Schmidt boring head which takes six millimeter tooling and has a micro adjust here on this uh, ring. You spin this knurled ring and it adjusts itself. It has a very small adjustment range but I need this only for holes up to maybe 10 millimeters. So another tool for the arsenal. Uh, this will need severe modif modification. It's a mo more stable one shank but I will cut it off and turn it to a straight shank so I can use it directly in a 10 millimeter collet which will make tool change going from pre-drill to precision boring head here uh, go very fast. Uh, here are the other tools I'm using. This is the solid carbide turning tool. It has a nice chip breaker ground into it and is uh, diamond lapped. On, on every surface and it has a tiny tiny radius on it. Works beautiful. Was an old hard milling end mill, very good carbide quality. The 0.4 millimeter wide grooving tool, also ground out of an old end mill. As I said, uh, old end mills are usually excellent carbide quality, nice fine grain, can be ground very sharp. This is ground on the big grinder. The parting tool I use, these triangular in the inserts, these are P-horn. I'm using these because I got about a hundred of them for from, from a viewer sent to me, used ones, and you can grind and regrind and reshape them a million times before they are completely gone. Works quite well. I made the holder myself, it has just this shape in, milled into it and has a screw bolt with a nut on the side holding the the insert. It's not the ideal design. In reality a clamp that pushes down from the top on the insert would be better. But works so far. Uh, used this for maybe five years now. Quite nice. 
Oh, and one, one last thing in regards to lathe tooling. I do not like V-block tool holders that uh, have a, a, a V cutout where the round tooling goes in. I don't like them. I make things like this uh, with a precision, precision fit on the shank and then I, I slit them almost all the way through. Out of laziness I did this uh, standing upright and I milled the slot with a 3mm ball end mill all, almost all the way through. Then I case hardened it using a case hardening compound similar to caseonite and uh, cleaned it up. That's, that's my tooling block for, for 6mm uh, round shank tooling. And yes, I usually do not bother to cut off the old end mill side. Doesn't hurt. When you clamp uh, a, a tooling block like this, uh, usually you clamp only over the tool, not back here in thin air, because you will permanently deform or break. Here you can see all the parts in a tumbled finish, all cleaned, ultrasonic cleaned, and ready for assembly. As you can see, the, the tumbling media left a nice, even surface finish. It removes every ever so slight burr, evens out fine tool marks and just makes it look reasonably professional.